Before we get started, I wanted to point out a couple of links in the show description. Links to our listings at Podchaser and Apple Podcasts. Uh, please take a moment to rate us and even better, leave us a review. Now let's start the podcast that takes a historical and cultural view of the devil. This is The Devil You Don't Know. Hey, Don, what tacos does the devil eat? Real There's spicy no ones. Go that. Ones that burn on the way out. That's what I think. <laughs> evil tacos. Evil. Well, I don't know if they're evil. I don't know. I think maybe that's kind of a hi, how are you? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the stay. Bye, everyone. Oh, I left a gift okay. on the way out. a great podcast. Uh, let's wrap it up. <laughs> no, no. We're going to get started here. Welcome, everyone, to The Devil You Don't Know. And I am Don. And always, I am joined here, of course, with Emily. Hello. And Jeremy. Hey. And we are actually continuing our series on the ancient origins of the devil with a book club. Kind Woo! Of, book, sort of. Do book clubs have cheers? I just thought that was a book club cheer. I know they have wine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, they do have wine. They do have most, wine. Most book Apparently, have it's wine. like just a front to get together and drink like bottles and bottles of wine. After this book, we're going to need it. I think uh, <laughs> after this chapter, I needed it. <laughs> yeah. We are reading the book Origins of Satan, How Christians Demonize Jews, Pagans, and Heretics by Elaine Pagel. You know, a book about hope. <laughs> <laughs> Each episode will be a chapter in the book. So if you want to follow along, go grab your copy. The link is in the description of this episode if you want to pick that up. So that's the thing you can do. Today, we will be covering the introduction of the book and chapter one, the Gospel of Mark and the Jewish War. So strap in for that. Right. Wow. Upcoming episodes are going to be, well, so we have basically seven chapters-ish. Mm -hmm. uh, so chapter two is the social history of Satan from the Hebrew Bible to the Gospels. Chapter three is Matthew's campaign against the Pharisees deploying the devil. I'm pretty excited about that one myself. <laughs> Ooh. Deploying the devil. It's like submarine talk there. I don't know why I said that. Chapter four. I'm with Mark you. I'm following. Luke and J they had submarines then, right? Yep. Oh. Chapter Double four. Submarines. Luke and John claim Israel's legacy, the split widens. Chapter 5, Satan's earthly kingdom, Christians against pagans. This reminds Ooh, me of nice. like a big blockbuster movie, you know, like Aliens versus Predator. That's going to be an interesting chapter, though. I, I love the concept of Christians versus pagans because that's almost always a defining split, mm -hmm. unless you're a pagan, right? For Christians, it, that that was a very big catch-all when I was a kid of those well, who were pagans. Here's the thing, though: back in the day, there were more pagans than Christians. Oh yeah, so totally. it's kind of the reverse situation until about the third century CE. But yeah, before that, I mean Rome. Rome was pagan during oh, yeah. Jesus' time. Chapter 6, The Enemy Within, Demonizing the Heretics. And then we'll do an episode with the conclusion and final thoughts. So we got a pretty cool road ahead. Agreed. And I was reading this book, and I was just so taken back by how good it was as far as the historical content, the scholarship. I felt like it was a lot more readable than other like actual scholarly books that can be ooh, rough. I've got one on Jesus, the exorcist, and it is like reading the back of a sandpaper box. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Which is tough because that I want to know totally about Jesus. I, I want to know about Jesus, the exorcist, but I'm going to slog through that one, and we'll get to that episode later. 
Today, we're talking about the Gospel of Mark and the Jewish War. And once again, this there's so much information in this chapter that I just felt like so much. my normal, like, I'm going to do some research and then... I'll present it to you you guys and you can react. I'm like, I, I can't do that with this book. Right. Like, it's just so much. And so I'm dragging you on this journey with me. <laughs> Kicking and screaming in some, some situations, I think. Moaning and drinking mostly, but yeah, yeah. I get you. <laughs> It'll work. We have read the chapters, chapters, because the introduction was part of that as well. I realized that I have 20 plus years of biblical criticism study, New Testament scholarship that I've studied throughout the years. I read uh, much of the New Testament in Koine Greek, you know, because I took Greek. I was a classical languages major in college. Now, I never really went in, on to the master's degree. That would have been cool. This is kind of my jam, but yeah. I didn't quite put two and two together, so to speak, that uh, you don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I'm not. reading this, this is like settling in on this bedrock of a lot of context that I already have. Yeah. And you may not. And by extension, the listeners probably don't. So I'm wondering what context do you think we're missing before we really dive into this book? One of the things that they came up was uh, I was talking with my coworkers about this podcast and that how we we're going to start going into this book. And where I saw several heads nod and go, wow, that sounds interesting. There were two people that came on and like, oh, that's a great book. I was like, you know it? They're like, oh, yeah, I've, I've read it. It's, it's pretty intense. And they weren't wrong about it being intense. I, I've Because my reading is so slow and I want to make sure I'm keeping on pace, I did the audiobook for this yeah. one. And so I listened through the prologue. And when it got a full hour in, I was like, oh, that's got to be the chapter. And then it said chapter one. Yeah. I was like, then oh. And, um, <laughs> the reason it feels like such a big deal is that the information is very dense. And the way that this particular author approaches it is very essay like it's it's very much a I have a purpose this is what we're doing I'm researching on this element we're going to talk about it in this category and this this bring up and so it it kind of went into it and I really did fall back on as much biblical knowledge as I had it, to kind of dive in like accept some things yeah to answer your question though I think one of the big contextual levels that was brought up inside the prologue and then throughout chapter 1 is the context of where the gospels came from yeah and the fact that these were not jesus's disciples that were recording what was happening in real time while exactly. they were following him yeah these were storytellers that happened years after jesus was mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. to tell their side of the story and to use these characters to create that context i, I think that was yeah that's a big element to really hold on to and, and keep in mind while we're going through these. I wondered if I should do a New Testament historical narrative criticism in five minutes kind of thing. Can you? Yeah. Is that even possible? I think I can try. Okay. Are you doing it right now? Yeah. yeah do, do we set the timer for you? I'm going to stay quiet and listen because this yeah, sounds fascinating. I'm, yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> The New Testament is not written in chronological order. Let's get that right out of the bag. In fact, the order of the Bible in which we have it, particularly the New Testament, wasn't set until the 3rd century, actually late 3rd century, up to 4th century, I should say, when the Vulgate, the Latin translation, the official Latin translation for the Catholic Church was translated. It's like, this is the set we have, boom. Boom. And from that point on, that is the order of the books that those are the books that we got in the Bible from there. Before then, we didn't have a collaborated collection. There was no book. Okay. 
there was a ton of different stories, different writings. We only know this because uh, actually recent, recent as in the last hundred years, uh, within the last hundred years, there was a major discovery in the 1940s in Nag Hammadi where they discovered a whole bunch of other writings about Jesus and about this time, and they just didn't make it into the canon. And it's not that the people at the time who were putting that together didn't know about them. It's just the process of elimination and whatever was going on at the time. We can probably get into biblical canonization later, but the point is, it's not written in chronological order. And the Gospels are not... Let me let me back up. There are no writings, there is no account that of anything of Jesus' life that happened while he was alive. Okay? So, everything that we have, first of all, we don't have first copies of anything. We don't have any original manuscripts. They are gone. They're long gone. We have copies. We have copies of copies. Before anyone gets like, oh, well, it's bullshit. No, no. There's plenty of things using scientific method and other applications that we can use to get at what's going on. So the translations that we have, always trying to improve them, but these extra writings really gave us a, a lot of context and verification that was really helpful. So we have this big smattering of different writings that were going on. We have multiple gospels. There's there is more than four gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, probably the, the most known that kind of came out was the gospel of Thomas. There is a gospel of Mary. I believe there's even a gospel of Jesus. So the other thing is the people that it that are on the names of these Gospels are not the people that wrote them. Right. So it's called Pseudepigrapha, which is essentially writing under a false name. We don't know exactly who they are, but we can kind of tell what they're writing about. We can get the context and we know when they lived and what they were facing, given how they wrote. So Mark is not written by this guy named Mark. John is not written by the John. Matthew, Luke, same thing. So we have that. Next section is the letters of Paul. So Paul, like Galatians, Ephesians, well, maybe some of the Ephesians, Corinthians letters, Romans. These letters were written by Paul who wrote some, I don't know, 15, 20 years after the death of Jesus. And then there are other letters attributed to Paul, but scholars are pretty much in agreement that Paul didn't write them. Um, Paul, of course, was a, uh, he was a Pharisee. I mean, he he was a persecutor of Jesus, or Jesus's followers, I should say. Mm -hmm. He had no first-hand knowledge of Jesus while he was alive. All of his stuff is after Jesus died. And what Paul writes about is, what does that mean? What does the death of Jesus mean? That's all his stuff is about. He hardly spends any time about what Jesus actually did and said. He spends his time theologically about what Jesus means. That's the first stuff we have written in the New Testament up until we get to Mark. And Mark is writing 35 years after the death of Jesus. So we're talking like in today's terms, back in the 80s, right? Right. But back in that time, you're talking now a full generation Mm -hmm. Right, because average lifespan was not seventy, eighty year old people. Yeah, like this. This was a this was a full generation past now. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't unheard of that people would live that long. But yeah, I mean, it's it's it, we have that, <laughs> and also it's a fucking brutal world. So right. But what Mark is going to do is there is a, all this time for thirty five years. People are people of the followers of Jesus have collected the parables. I mean, there's a lot of crowds that followed him around. 
and they tell the stories and they, they kind of line them up. And these stories circulate in these different communities. Some of them probably wrote them down. There's a few thoughts that there are common documents, which doesn't exist, but they must be, there's a common reference that later writers clearly are are using. So there's a sayings reference. So there's like a collection of Jesus's sayings. There's a collection of his parables. And so Mark takes all of these along with the 35 years of tradition and history that they, they have going on about the death of Jesus. And he is now living through this war and this war that the Jews in Jerusalem are rising up against Rome, the Romans. Right. And so it's this Jewish revolt against Roman occupation. That's a big deal. You know, that's yeah. that's kind of like the whole Ukraine thing right now, but on a much smaller scale, as in if it was just a city going against Russia. You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean... <laughs> It it's not a contest, but they hold their own for four years or so. And so Mark is writing in that particular context. A few years later, 10 to 15 or so, we get Matthew. And one thing about the I'm just going to talk about the four gospels right now. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptic gospels. And that is because Matthew and Luke definitely use parts of Mark in their Gospels. A lot of it is verbatim. A lot of it, they embellish a bit, but they definitely add their own. Mark and Luke also use another source, which scholars for years have called Q. And it is a collection of sayings. It's in common. You can see almost, again, verbatim. Doesn't appear in Mark, but Matthew and Luke say it exactly the same hmm, now okay so synoptic gospels that's what they mean is that there's there's a relationship there's copying there's you know things happening at the same time yeah. john then is there's different john. then there's john john's writing his own shit john's got his own agenda and we're gonna get into all of what i just talked about in way more detail but i i figured maybe this is a good time to sort of set this up and What's even more interesting is that for century, or well, for a better part of a century, uh, religious scholarship have said that Matthew and Luke were roughly written around the same time. Luke also wrote Acts, by the way, the book of Acts. Okay. So uh, we often refer to that as Luke Acts, but it's clearly the same author. Recent scholarship by Marcus Borg and some of his uh, colleagues have taken or had taken he marcus borg is passed but one of their projects was to lay out the new testament in chronological order the order that it was written and mm. it is a wonderful way to read the new testament because you certainly get kind of an interesting thematic context out of the whole thing well in his scholarship, in his work, he actually places Luke and Acts much later. Like much later. Second century CE. Oh wow. Hundreds of years after the death of Jesus. There is some very compelling evidence as to why that is. But that makes me kind of call into the question the whole sort of understanding around Q, right? If yeah. Luke wrote so much later, he had access to Matthew and Luke and John. So, yeah, there's there's some very interesting stuff uh, around that. And so he actually places Luke and Acts significantly later than tradition has said. Mm. Um, and then uh, and then there's Revelation, which is its own interesting piece of <laughs> yeah, literature. It's it for me. It's always been New Testament. And revelations. Yeah. <laughs> Which, uh, again, when you're putting to this story together, it makes a lot of sense. You put revelation at the end. It's kind of poetic in that way. It wasn't written the final book. Right. Um, so 
That's prob that's more than five minutes, but um, <laughs> I forgive you. That was that was an excellent summary. Thank you. Uh, is summary the right word? But well, excellent, I, excellent background. I enjoyed listening to you tell all of that um, because your enthusiasm came through and <laughs> you're clearly passionate about it. It's much more fun to hear you talk about it than sit and read words on a page. That I hear you. Are my very, my very hope is that I'll make this book a lot more fun for you. Yay! Um, I do love history. I just like I like listening to history lectures and watching documentaries. Like, yeah, I like I like reading. Audiobook is a lecture. Fiction, <laughs> fun, entertaining stories. So, anyway, go ahead. Okay, so there's some context now. When we're talking about historical criticism, one of the things that you have to do in trying to verify history is. Find sources that are not in the Bible to verify. Right. What other writings do we have yes. simultaneously that were written in other areas, nearby cultures? Does anybody mention this stuff? And turns out two very notable things. There's probably more, but they're gone. They're lost to history. But there are two authors that are heavily used in looking at this, and that is... Flavius jo Josephus, Josephus, Flavius Josephus, <sighs> Flavius Josephus. It's a good drink. Um, yeah, <laughs> he is. Well, we'll talk about him in a bit. And the other one is Philo. He was a Greek writer as well and writer of history. They were both writing for the purpose of documenting history. That does not mean they were objective. <laughs> and historians are able to look at these other writings and apply the same criticism on those as well, trying to understand why they wrote it the way they did. Uh, what was their motivations for presenting this? So we'll get into a bit more on Josephus. Josephus is used a lot in talking about the Gospels because... He's able to talk about probably one of the biggest writings he has is The Jewish War. He wrote in Greek primarily, so it was easy to uh, read the New Testament and go to Josephus. Philo did too as well. Did Josephus write in Greek because that was the contemporary language yeah. of the time? That was the easiest written? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. It's very possible or likely that he did know Latin but he didn't write it. Okay. And the reason why I say that is because, well, first off, Josephus would, was Jewish, so he's going to know Hebrew. Yeah. The spoken language of the time was Koine Greek, which is a specific dialect of Greek, and a quite a bit less formal. And then he was also a Roman sympathizer. I definitely got that out of the book. Yeah. Anyway, we'll we'll get more into him in a in a bit. That's my before you get into this book. Here's kind you know of Here you some. Go. <laughs> hopefully that helps because this book kind of relies on at least understanding how that works. You're right in that it's pretty dense, and it is even for me. But it's not so dense like a dry textbook for me. This scholarship. She's written this for a more public consumption. I know that's kind of hard to believe, you know, believe but <laughs> but she has Does she sort know of, that? She has sort of uh, brought it down to a more conversational <laughs> level. So that should give you some idea of what <laughs> the next step up is really. And so I I really enjoyed a lot of what she had to say and what her perspectives. Elaine Pagels is I'm going to read a little bit from Princeton. This is where she teaches. Elaine Pagels is a historian of religion, a Harrington Spear Payne professor at Princeton University and Aspen Institute trustee. She's probably best known for as the author of the Gnostic Gospels, The Origin of Satan and Adam and Eve and the Serpent, which we will also get into that book a little bit later. Her focus really has been in the religions of the Mediterranean in antiquity and sexuality and politics. Hmm. So perspectives that are needed, especially today. 
she's widely respected by the religious and non-religious alike. So cool. I'm glad to hear that some of the people you've talked to about this have are like, oh yeah, I, I've, I'm familiar with that. Yeah, they 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 definitely knew her, and and not just knew of her, but knew the work. Mm-hmm. They they knew the origins of Satan, and they're like, oh yeah, it's a good book. I read it. Yeah. Recognizable and referenceable. Okay, so the introduction. She asks us as the readers to consider Satan as a reflection of how we perceive ourselves and those we call others, quote unquote, others. Satan defines negatively what we think as human. I think that's interesting. Satan defines negatively what we think of as human. And then she goes on to talk about human and not human. There's like these binary opposites, right? Right. There's there's two pairs. Human versus non-human. We versus they. And so the two are often combined. So we are human. They are not. And it's that us versus them. And she does make the point that it's not that we don't see or people who do this don't see the humanity in others, but it's 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 natural is is what I remember her saying. So it, yeah. it is, it's a human nature thing that we we define in, in those two categories and that we combine them, which I thought was really fascinating when she said that it, it, it's always creating the other. Mm-hmm. Right. And having that otherism because you have all the way back to. Mine is safe. That is not safe. Those are not safe. Mine is healthy, right? It's, it was always part of the human condition of that. And like, that's not just Mark. That's not just in the Bible. Like that's history. That's, that's Mm -hmm. human experience that we all do that. Which I I thought was really interesting. Absolutely. I needed to include this quote just right out of the book, which it's a quote that she quotes. (laughs) I don't know how many times I'm going to say quote, but here it is. A society does not simply discover its others. It fabricates them by selecting, isolating, and emphasizing an aspect of another people's life and making it symbolize their difference. You just basically said that, Jeremy. We create our others. Yeah, we, we we seek them out. Yeah, we don't just go, oh, there's another. (laughs) <laughs> no <laughs> we made them another yeah which is really interesting to me if nothing else i think that's the underlying thread of all this whole satan business is us versus them it's that polar binary situation where my stuff is good your stuff is not and that, again, it's kind of this human, natural thing that we seem to do. Also, to our point in our previous conversation, though, from the other week, that maybe we don't know if other animals think in terms of good and evil. Oh, uh, right. I remember we say that we were trying to say that that was a distinctly human feature, right? That, that we're yeah. like, well, that's the, something we do. But like... The truth is, we just don't speak as many animal languages as we think we do, and, and that that may be happening constantly. That there, yeah. there's always that sense of who they are yeah. versus who we are. It's a distinctly human thing. It, this is true until it's not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The other uh, quote that she throws in there in the introduction is a, a quote from Kierkegaard. An unconscious relationship is more powerful than a conscious one. And that Mm. struck me a lot, that the unconscious relationship is more powerful than the one you're aware of, that the one you're engaging. What did you take away from that? Or what do you you think of that? Meh. Really? (laughs) That that was my take on it. I I mean, if you're consciously aware of something, you think on it. Yeah, it's, it's like... This is here. I know it's here. I acknowledge that. It enters into my mind on occasion. If there's an unconscious relationship, it's unconscious. You're not even aware of it, really. And so why 
you're not thinking on it. In your mm-hmm. mind, it's not there. It doesn't exist. Like, that's right. how I took it. So I, I was just like, that's just a bunch of word salad. Let's put some fun words together that will make people think on it. And but I, I don't for me, that didn't. Well, let me contextualize it for, it for you. Let me let me put it another way. The devil you don't know is more powerful than the devil you do. Examples that come to my mind are like unconscious bias, unconscious discrimination, repressed trauma, maybe things that you aren't aware of, but you relate to things that you don't even think about, and they can have a significant impact on your life or others, your bias, your privilege. You can't always know what effect you have on the things that are around you, you know, and it could be incredibly powerful. But that doesn't, but as a rule that it's not more powerful. Like the quote says that it's more powerful than the conscious ones. Now, see, the, the way I heard that, the way I saw it was great example. You are my friends. I chose you, you chose me, we sought each other out, and we have a friendship that we have developed. My children are my children, and my parents are my parents. I didn't, I didn't set that up. That, that is an unconscious relationship that we have. That, that is something that we're there, and I might be aware of them in, like, in cultivating that relationship, but that's, that bond, that kind of connection that we have together is built Good or bad, it's it's built and and it's and it seems very very intent and powerful in all that it is. Whereas something I'm paying attention to and working on focusing on and remembering and building is good to have it there, but it doesn't have the same type of, in my opinion, the same kind of gravity or, or weight that's there for something that's always in the back of my mind. It's always always there, whether I'm consciously thinking about keeping my children alive or keeping them going, it's, it's happening. Mm-hmm. They, they, there's something I'm focused to, and I'm, I'm bonded to that. Yeah. That's how I was interpreting it. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So I was interpreting it in a terms of, like, there is way more unconscious relationships than there are conscious ones for mm-hmm. for an individual person. For my realization was that I exist in the world, and I have relationships that maybe I don't even know about, whether it's just being a participant in one part of this particular society or whatever, but that also my actions may impact others without me knowing it. To me, that's that's kind of, yeah, whether you agree with it or not, that's that's kind of where I went with with that. Maybe I'm too literal because the quote is comparing the two and says that one is stronger or Mm -hmm. more powerful than the other. I think they're they're both powerful. I, why do you have to pit one against the other and say this one is stronger? I I, I don't know. It Welcome to well philosophy. I know. <laughs> That's definitely not my thing. But yeah, it just again, I I think the quote was just trying to be catchy and using those words like I I don't know. That's Kierkegaard. Didn't, didn't like it. He had things to say. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. So she says that her book is about how the events of the Gospels about Jesus and his advocates and his enemies, how they correlate with the supernatural drama that the writers use to interpret this story. You know, the struggle between God's spirit and Satan. I mean, that is so prevalent. Through You can't have the New Testament without that. She also kind of makes the point that Christians identify with the disciples, we, the humans. Right. And Christians or Christians identify their opponents, other Jews, pagans, heretics, with evil and Satan, they, non-human. So, again, just kind of setting up that whole we versus they – us versus them, human, non-human. That's the foundation for demonization, right? Right. Because it's the non-human within or acting against, because that was the other doing it to me or against me or or whatever that is. Yeah. Okay, let's get into chapter one. Ooh, we made it! Yeah. Chapter one now. Chapter one's much more interesting than the introduction. (laughs) 
<laughs> All right. To me, anyway. I like that enthusiasm. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> okay, so we mentioned... It's not a bad book. I, I, I'm afraid that people are going to think that I hated this, and I didn't hate it. I didn't. It's maybe just not what you're expecting, but I didn't know to set you up for that. Right. Yeah. After reading the introduction and reading those philosophical mm -hmm. BS stuff... <laughs> uh, I was just like, nah, this is not for me. But then, and then chapter one happened, which was much better. Definitely more okay. in the historical realm for yes, like for you. facts. This happened, then this happened, and then this happened. Yeah, see, I can get behind that. All about the facts, not unconscious relationships, <laughs> more powerful than <laughs> conscious ones. What does that even mean? That means nothing. Let's just throw words together. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I'm here with you. I even have stuff underlined. Page 14. I've hey, underlined page 14. Nice. 15. I've underlined. Taken notes. <laughs> so can we just skip to there? <laughs> so, uh, well, that's kind of what we're going to do. This book is dense enough that, to me, my approach is I read it first. Then I go back and read it to underline or highlight. And then I listen to the audio. Oh, see, I, d I don't have the audio on it. The library doesn't have the audio on, and mm. I'm just like, audible. If that's all I had, if like Jeremy, if that's all I had, yeah, I would have to stop so many times to chew on what the hell was just said. Yeah, I love audiobooks for fun, entertaining stories and stuff, but like this, a textbook or whatever, I, I need a print yeah. copy of it. I, I And um, there are times where I would read a page... A couple of times, because the first time I'm like, what? Interesting. What does that mean? And I'd get lost in a train of thought, and then I have to go back and reread it. <laughs> oh, really? I'd have to read it a couple times because I would just, like, zone out when yep. I was reading because I was not, it was not gripping. And you call yourself a history nerd. <laughs> I am. No, I, 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 I. You just don't like to I read. Love, yeah, I don't. Reading history is dry. <laughs> but listening to people who are passionate about history, like talking about it and discussing it, that's fascinating. Watching documentaries where things play out, that's yeah. fascinating. But reading history, as someone who loves history, um, I admit it is dry to just <laughs> okay. read that stuff. But let's Fair continue. Enough. Let's get to page 14 uh, because page 14 and 15, they were great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm going to jump in to, we were talking about Josephus before. Yes. So I'm going to ask you the question, who, uh, just from your reading, what you, what you gleaned, who is Josephus and why does he matter for this? He he was there, and he was recording things down, telling history. Mm -hmm. Like, he, he is... Yeah, know. but he was telling history from a particular angle. Yeah. Yes, but he, he was there. He wanted to notate things that were actually happening, yeah. like, so that there was a record. Yeah, definitely. Um, and uh, I think he, a part of that was for his own kind of self-preservation right he was a governor <laughs> of galilee yeah right and so the idea of of very much there was times that you could see it in in the way it was showing up in the book that like josephus is on the wrong side of history and he very much had to like no no this is what actually happened it wasn't my fault i didn't do all these things it was, and, and like these were the bad guys over here they're encircling them in red like mm -hmm. look at them they're really bad that's why i had to do it this way i didn't do it it was very much the the uh, creating that other, like we were just talking about, right? Like, yeah. hey, it's not my fault. And he has to tote that line, too, because he's Jewish. He changed sides. He switched. And he's pretty much pro-Roman, but he's Jewish. He gets invited to Rome, and he is just taken aback at oh, the resources and the society and the sheer military might. Uh, that Rome has. You don't cross these people. <laughs> right. You know, no one has any chance against the Romans. Yeah. This is... If you can't beat them, join them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
So, and then he's sort of annoyed by his Jewish communities back home who are saying, we don't want to be under, you know, Roman revolt. See the life of Brian. <laughs> now, this is, let, let's give the historical bit here. So this is after Jesus's death. Yes. This is about three decades after 66 CE is when the revolt broke out, mm -hmm. but brewing – and she makes the point that a lot of the sentiment was that the reason all of this is happening is because of this Jesus nonsense. But Jesus well, yeah. was not a revolutionary. No, he had a very small little – following mm -hmm. yeah and he i mean i mean he drew crowds that's that's sure. pretty well yeah. documented but and it was very charismatic but uh, he and his followers made up such a small percentage of the yeah. jewish population now it's entirely possible that he said some seditious things you know he certainly talked I'm not going to get into that. This podcast is about the devil. I could talk a lot about the pol political aims of Jesus and, and that sort of thing, but I, that's not what we're here for. <laughs> the point is that for the purposes of this chapter, he had more of a beef with the Jewish tradition and the authorities of the time. It was an internal matter, right? It was kind of like Martin Luther with the Catholic Church. A little bit, right? It, you know, it's, it's kind of it, like, yeah. That's pretty clear. Like, like when you look at whatever the Gospels are, like, like his his hatred for the Pharisees and for the hypocrisy that was in there, like that that shows up a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm not convinced that Jesus was the spark that caused the disarray and the deciding to want to revolt against the Romans. I mean, I, I think. The the seeds of that born. It was building long yeah. before yeah. he it was, was there, building a long time. Yeah, so there's a lot of factions involved. But by the time Josephus is writing this, he documents that there were three main factions in Jerusalem that were dividing the city. There was the priestly party that was just working for peace with the Romans. They were <laughs> we don't we don't want any conflict. Diplomacy. Um, we'll, we'll work this out. Then there's the revolutionaries from the countryside. Kill them all! <laughs> <laughs> and then Josephus talks about this second anti-Roman party led by essentially elitist Jerusalemites who wanted to maintain their power against the radicals from the countryside. They didn't want to be grouped in with these uh, poor people. <laughs> <laughs> and sort of higher society, higher elite, but still anti-Roman, still wanted independence from Roman occupation. So you mentioned that uh, Josephus was a former governor of governor Galilee. Galilee. Yeah. yeah. So he was governor of Galilee. There was another prominent, we'll talk about him in a, uh, in a little bit more detail, but there was another prominent governor of Galilee. Do you remember who that was? Um. Not by name, off the top of my head. Pontius Pilate. Oh, sure. I yeah. didn't think of him as a governor of Galilee. Yeah. But that yeah, that's title. true. Boy, or did we get a different picture of him in this yeah, chapter. Yeah, that's true. That yeah. was pretty awesome. So, we've covered a bit of the Jewish war. You know, there's these different factions. Finally, the fire was, was lit, and... There is a revolt. And so eventually the Roman legions are going to come in and uh, there was a siege and it was pretty awful. And Josephus documents kind of reporting for the, the Romans, his Jewish communities thought he was a traitor. Mm -hmm. And then every time that there was a setback for the Romans, the Romans thought they were double crossing him. <laughs> Or he was oh, that's right. Them. Yeah, they, they thought that he was – as soon as something was wrong, they're like, hey, our spy's not doing it right. Yeah. 
So he was constantly on this balancing act. What a horrible life. Why would you want to do that? Really liking your position. Really liking power. Yeah, that's what it's about, (laughs) right? Yeah. Yeah. So this is going on. And this war, as you can imagine, it's not swift. It drags on for four years. It's brutal. And it's brutal in that typically the Romans will seek out any sign of sedition and torture and publicly execute via crucifixion, mostly. A lot of people don't necessarily make the connection, but one of the other really famous characters of history who actually lived led a slave revolt and ended up crucified as a public demonstration that you don't revolt against the Romans. Mm -hmm. His name was Spartacus. This is how the Romans do things and why they do it. You cause trouble that is a threat to the peace of the state. We don't tolerate that at all. And it's brutal. And so you're going to have witnesses of Romans coming down on the Jews hard. You're going to see communities of Jews trying to like not be a part of it or to try to smooth things over and, and, Stay neutral ground, maybe even turning fellow Jews over. Yeah. And then and then we get into Mark and the followers of Jesus, and we figure out that the followers of Jesus didn't really think that this whole Roman thing mattered much. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it sucked, but their priority was that the end of the world was coming. Real quick, none of this matters because the end of the world is going to happen within their lifetime. That is definitely one of Jesus's primary teachings is that the kingdom of God is near. Says this a lot in a lot of the other um, extra, what they call extra testamental writings, definitely verify or definitely talk about how, you know, he was very much of the mind that. The world was going to end cosmically very, very soon. So literally, not in the figurative sense. Yeah. It is the end of times. Yeah. So, Mark. This gospel is attributed to co-worker of one of the disciples, I believe. It was written during the last year of this war, or just after the war, right around 70 CE. So again, the the revolt bro- broke out around sixty six. Okay, yeah, um, it's it's anonymous. We don't know where it was written specifically, but we know when. And it's clear that the author takes sides between the Jews and the Romans, and the follower of Jesus versus other Jews. And what's really interesting is that Mark essentially invents a new way to tell a story. Hmm. He writes. Like it's a historical documentation or a historical account, but it's theology. It's mythology disguised as history. And this became quite popular. And that's why it sort of gained ground because it lent credence to what it said because it sounded real or it read like history. That doesn't mean that the re- that the readers read it as literal history. I think that they definitely and what Pagels talks about is that you know the the readers of Mark's gospel originally probably are looking to this as how the hell do we live right now? Right. And what can we learn from this teacher that died 35 years ago? So <laughs> I think again the author takes pains to illustrate that Jesus's followers is not a threat to the Roman Empire. They're good. Right. <laughs> Jesus was not a threat. Clearly, you killed the shit out of him. <laughs> We're good. And he, he doesn't totally exonerate the Romans. He doesn't fully exonerate Pontius Pilate. They are not the focus of the the conflict right yeah for jesus jesus's conflict is with the other 
Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests, and the scribes. And so Mark's beef is with them. These are the people that did not accept Jesus as the Messiah. He's going to blame them for his execution, which may or may not be true. Right. But that's that's the story element that we we're talking about, right? So, so he's telling it as though it were historical, but he's doing his own story of it. So creating that, uh, let's bring in the title, creating that devil in, yeah. in, in those other people, that, that other. Yeah. Again, the Romans were absolutely superior. They So, uh, you know, as you know, as we read, the Romans come in after siege. They finally sack Jerusalem. They tear down the temple. They desecrate it by right. worshiping their gods on it. And then they go about the inhabitants of the city and rape and pillage and kill and slaughter as a sign of, like, dominance. It's the worst. <laughs> it's so awful. It is terrible. Now, we go back to Mark's gospel, who probably just witnessed this. Uh, the writer is feeling that consequence and writes that essentially Jesus predicted this exact thing would happen. He he writes in his story that Jesus looks at his disciples because they they went to Jerusalem and they marvel at the buildings and the, and the temple. And he says, you know, not, let me tell you, not one stone will be left on stone. Right. I think that from our eyes, I don't think it's fully comprehended that this is self-fulfilling prophecy. This is easy to write when it's already happened. Sure, yeah. <laughs> and, and Jesus said, he, Jesus called it, this is totally going to happen, you know, before it happened, that it's already happened. But he said yeah. he was going to. Yeah. So I, I call this out because for two reasons, that's what happened. And, and that's what a lot of this writing is about. A lot of it is retroactively retconning the events to fit the narrative as yeah. they're writing it. The MCU does this shit all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, what do we do about this plot hole? We got it. We got it. <laughs> Multiverse, baby. Let's, let's let's figure that figure one out. <laughs> yeah. The New Testament is basically its own multiverse. So, I mean, really, so she she makes that point that, that the Mark's gospel is intended to reassure the followers of Jesus and, again, show that they are not a threat to the Romans. And I think the other thing that she points out that I thought was really interesting, and this is kind of where a lot of this is leading to, is that Mark's readers were not just the Jewish proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah followers. He was also aware of the growing Gentile, you know, the non-Jewish oh, followers yeah. of Jesus. And that's significant because Paul, the letters of Paul, remember he wrote 20 years before, 10, 15 years before Mark, Paul pretty much is exclusively writing to Gentiles. Uh, yes. R he right. he is evangelizing to the Greeks. And so the followers of Jesus prior to Mark is building. And it's definitely Jewish and non-Jewish. And by the way, just to make it clear, there's not one religion building here. Like, there's lots of little sects or little cults or whatnot that they don't all agree. Yeah, they still don't. Yeah. <laughs> Southern Baptism versus Presbyterian, right? They're, yeah. They're, they, they still do it. I think it's interesting that she makes a point that uh, that Mark might even be taking into consideration that some Romans might be followers of Jesus and appealing to their point of view or appealing to them not killing the fuck out of them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Soften that blow a little bit. Yeah. So I wanted to back up for one second and just ask the question, you know, we, we've just been talking about historical counts versus narrative stories. Why do you think it's important to have both, especially when they contradict? Historical versus what? No. Narrative. 
like well narrative mytholo- would be like telling a story mm-hmm. um it's i think it's more important to have that you have history for the context you have narrative for the storytelling aspect and um what better way to learn than that mm-hmm. uh, and- history hi- history gives you the background but i mean even jesus he taught in telling parables um, people learn by having a, a story to learn from. Even if we go all the way back to uh, Genesis, the creation of people, Adam and Eve. I, most people don't believe that that actually happened, but, but having that story for how everything began in the world is, is a good starting point to learn of where we come from. Uh, mm-hmm. and and what our purpose is. So that's, yeah, narrative history. There you go. Well, the cynic filmmaker in me takes that one step further and says that you, if you are going to sell something in a commercial, you have to let people know what they don't have. And you have to, you have to make them aware of what they're missing, whether or not they think they are or not. So I think that when a narrative is told, especially in relation to historical context, it is to sell something. It's to give that opinion or Mm -hmm. to really convince someone of something else other than just this is a great way to learn. It's all about the this is the important piece of everything that was happening in the background. Pay attention to this thing, which is why they, they put a focus on that. That's a good point. I think that's a good segue because why did Mark write this? You know, he's, he's writing at the end of this overwhelmingly, (laughs) you know, destructive four years. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I, she breaks it down nicely. She says, reflecting on 35 years and, and especially the, the Jewish war that just was decimated, how do followers of this Jesus guy who was brutally executed as a seditionist, as a traitor or an enemy of the state, no one refutes that that's why he was executed. Right. That his followers and his enemies alike agree on that was the charge. Whether or not it was true or whether or not, what he, but that was the charge is that he was a seditionist. How is it that their Messiah, the God's chosen one, was freaking brutally executed as a traitor of the state, and then for 35 years, his followers are scattered to the hills, persecuted, hunted, executed, hunted, often meeting in secret so they don't get found out, and then you've got you know the threat of the other Jews having it really fed up with Roman occupation and this giant, massive, horrible war. How do you make sense that any of this matters? How can he still be the Messiah? How can we still hang on to that? That's what he's selling. He's selling a reason why Jesus is still the Messiah, that this, this is nothing compared to what's coming. And that's the theological aspect of it. Hmm. It's a theodicy. It's trying to answer how the hell can God, our good God, who sent us this amazing Messiah, allow this brutality to happen to his chosen followers? <laughs> yeah. And Pagels presents that Mark's answer is because Satan intervened and tried to defeat Jesus, tried to defeat God's anointed one. And, and his followers and his movement. The forces of evil led by Satan orchestrated and, and led to Jesus' execution and influenced all of the enemies of his followers to crush them. And Satan's the one. Satan's to blame. And and that's and just to be clear, that's Pagel's interpretation of Mark's writing. That's not Pagel's adding that in, right? Because Mark was Correct. the one that said that there was the satanic conflict and that Satan was causing this. Yeah, 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 I'm, and but this isn't unique to Pagels. She's pointing out what's already there. Sure, it's interesting that instead of in the face of all of this atrocity, the real truth that Mark brings or Mark is selling is that this is actually a cosmic battle between God and the devil. 
that we can see that God's anointed one, the chosen, God's spirit came down and entered Jesus at his baptism. That's like the first event that happens in Mark's gospel. So we're already setting up that yeah. Jesus is the the God-infused human. The God shell. Yeah. Uh, and then he goes off and tussles with the devil and angels and wild animals and stuff, you know, in the wilderness. There's no human beings in sight for 40 days. Yeah. So it's this cosmic thing. And because he's died, Mark sort of influences or, or writes how Satan influences the Pharisees or hardens their heart or the crowds that call for his execution. I like he, that it's, I mean, it's, it seems very Josephus in that, like, he took a very solid note from them. Like, okay, so fun fact, it's not your fault that Jesus died. It's not even your fault that Jesus died, Jews versus Romans. It's, it's Satan, everybody. <laughs> you, were, you were attacked and your mind was possessed by the Satan guy. You didn't even know you were doing it. So good job, everyone. I think we'll call it a truce. Yeah, yeah. we're good. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the brilliance of it? I just yeah. love how you said, that's so Josephus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that's I... my favorite part so far. That's so Josephus. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, and put that into perspective, right? Okay, so it's not my fault. It's not your fault. It's, it's Satan's fault. It's the devil's fault. What's happening? The end of times is happening. Cosmic right. shit is happening. All this stuff, there's signs that the end is coming. You know, the worse things get, the surer it becomes. You know, none of this, or for Jesus' followers, none of this mattered. None of this, you know, Roman conflict thing. They're just trying to prepare for being taken up. Right. It's it's the small battle, not the war. Yeah. That that's That's part of it. Yeah. And she makes a point that the Gospels, and she even goes through the other four or the other three, they never, none of them ever associate Satan with the Romans. Satan is always associated with Jesus' enemies, Judas Iscariot in particular, even as Satan appearing as Judas Iscariot, which I thought was interesting. So then there's Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate. Who is this guy? Uh... I found it quite funny when she was saying he got bullied a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pushed over. Uh, He's like, oh, well, he does kind of get pushed over and get, you know, tossed up to the emperor. And <laughs> like, he's not in good favor, right? Yeah. And so he yeah. doesn't want a bunch of people going and tattling on him. Like, yeah. this guy's over here doing all this shit. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. He pissed off someone in Rome. They're like, you know where are you going? You're going to Jerusalem. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. You got the Galilee trap. They're like, oh, no, no, no. Oh, God. I mean, I think that's probably something that he would have said. I mean, he it is clear from historical documents that Pilate was not a fan. He was very, very irritable <laughs> in the <laughs> kindest way to his Jewish communities. So in the Gospels, we get this very reluctant... You know, thinking that Jesus is, might even be, you know, falsely accused. His hands are tied. The the crowds are demanding a an execution. And yeah, yeah he's definitely a sympathetic character. The yeah. way he's portrayed like that. And yeah. the, all of the gospels mimic that and mm -hmm. amplify it. But history, you know, Josephus and Philo have very different accounts and there's actually she goes on to talk about other records that they had uh where pilot the actual pilot was absolutely a tyrant he he <clears throat> would swindle from the temple treasury he <laughs> you know he would uh often hold executions without trial most of them right. jews most of them jews most of them seditionists yeah that like that that seemed to be his rubber stamp. Like if he it got just, three, he had sedition approved, denied, and it just like all right, sedition, sedition, yeah. <laughs> just like run him through. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, and, and they tell a story how the garrison would bring in this uh, banner, and 
in Jerusalem, it was very well known that you don't bring in, you don't fly a banner with symbols or likenesses of the emperor or anyone else that might be considered idolatry, right? This is a very big Jewish concept. And even on the coins, they, uh, they would not print during certain, you know, occupations or whatnot. They, they were at least trying to be sensitive to the Jewish way of life to not put graven in images and, you know, on the coins and stuff. Yeah. But Pilate at night, wrapped up in, in blankets and whatnot, marches this garrison in and unfurls this banner that is flying Caesar's image uh, as a giant fuck you to the the Jewish communities. And they protest and anyway, so on and so forth. But he's known for these kind of asshole shenanigans yeah shenanigans great use of that word 100 percent. pontius pilot asshole <laughs> shenaniganers <laughs> asshole shenaniganers <laughs> such a ne'er-do-well <laughs> <laughs> somebody better talk to him <laughs> <laughs> well and as the story goes they they went over his head to the emperor and emperor spanked him and said you're going somewhere else now yeah, All right. legitimate. So the Gospel of Mark, even though there's so much uh, talk, you know, the beef is with the Jewish leaders. Uh, the story reads like that, not so much the, the Romans. Pagels takes pains to say that Mark is not anti-Jewish and he's not anti-Semitic by any stretch. I mean, most of his characters are Jewish. He is Jewish. But the conflict here is within the community of the Jewish, you know, way of life. It's, it's more like a, a, like you say, the Reformation or whatnot. The, the figure of Satan as it emerged of the centuries in Jewish tradition is not a hostile power assailing Israel from without, but the source and representation of conflict within the community. Mm -hmm. That's a quote from the book of the last page of the chapter. So. It wasn't intended to be anti-Semitic. It was talking about this, this internal affair that they were trying to, to handle. But as time goes on and as that Christian community, as the followers of Jesus became more and more Gentile, more and more not Jewish, that context gets kind of lost. And for those who don't understand you know, the Jewish way of life, this kind of reads like it's the Jews' fault. And even Luke, this is where some of that discussion of why they think Luke was written significantly later is how he talks about the Jews. Um, it's just so commonplace for him that it's more more common for second century than it would have been um, in the earlier. But it's easy to see how when you lose that Jewish context that it can be used for anti-Semitism. Sure. Absolutely. Because, because um, that's what you're looking at is those must be the bad guys. You're yeah. already using your own otherism that that's showing up for you because they have been separating themselves from you for so long. And now inside the narrative, they're also acting on Satan's behalf or, or whatever it is. And so obviously those are all bad. Yeah. Totally, totally see how that can get factored in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and and the farther you get away from the event, the easier it is to read something else yep. and move forward with that. So let's wrap this up, shall we? Okay. All we right. did it. We, we got the, through the prologue and chapter one. And chapter and it one. It only took half as long as actually listening to the book. <laughs> <laughs> that means there's a whole lot we didn't talk about but i think we hit the main points anyway you know uh satan defines negatively what we think of as human we talked about mm -hmm. we human they not so much mark creates this new form of narrative the gospel reads like history but conveys a theology like a mythology and a narrative and this was in the context of the Jewish rebellion, which just saw the destruction of the temple and the desecration. Yeah. Yeah. It was a big deal. Still a big deal, right? 
still a big deal. And I think, you know, for Mark, Satan is the source and representation of the conflict, again, within the Jewish community, not some outside cosmic force assailing, you know, everything else. So my final thoughts are, are this. Decades after their teacher was rounded up and executed for sedition, Jesus's followers, rather than face the uncomfortable truth that the end Jesus predicted still hadn't come yet, they placed their current plight of suffering upon a narrative of a cosmic struggle between good and evil. Jesus received God's spirit as his baptisms infused in, in divine energy. And those who did not see God's spirit in him were obviously agents of Satan. Obviously. While Satan won this skirmish by killing the fuck out of Jesus and causing a whole bunch of terribleness in the years that followed, uh, the cosmic war had just begun and God had already conquered Angromenu. Wait, I mean Satan. Um, <laughs> The writers, trying to make sense of what has happened, has demonized the other while trying not to get annihilated by the Romans. As followers, again, get further and further away from history uh, of when the gospel is written, the original intent is distanced and favored of deeper demonizing and eventually anti-Semitism. So yeah. the question has come up before, um, is not in this podcast, but in my conversations with others, is the creation of Satan also just born out of the creation of anti-Semitism? This is a claim that a lot of critics have that they've levied that, that the devil is was born out of anti-Semitism or, or hate hmm. for the Jews. So far, what do you think? No. I don't think so. I, I mean, even the general context of, of Satan as the adversary, right? Knowing its its original term and usage, um, I don't believe that the Satan themselves was pointed at Jews, or or that hatred of Jews was because of the Satan or other way around. I, I don't I don't see that being there. I, I think there anyone can draw lines right and create a bridge between the two for sure. But even in just the context of the way Mark was writing it, Satan is something other than the Jews. It's exactly. something other than the Romans. It, it, it is a cosmic battle, and Jews mm -hmm. are not cosmic. That's yeah. that's another part of what he was just describing, right? This is our little thing. We're just people. Uh, so I, I would not say that that was the creation of it was for the sake of Jew hatred. Yeah. I'm with you. It led to it. Yeah, but I totally it was agree her. with that. It wasn't um, the original intent. I agree. And we're going to get a lot more context about that, about Satan from the Hebrew Bible in this next episode on Chapter 2, The Social History of Satan from the Hebrew Bible to the Gospels. So, okay. Buckle up. Then. Chapter 2, yeah. baby. <laughs> we have just started on this journey, and uh, I'm gonna, we're going to see it through. This is this is going to be good. All right. We'll watch you see it through. <laughs> <laughs> so, Josephus. <laughs> you are listening to the Devil You Don't Know podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe. It's right there in your podcast app. No, not that. Uh, yeah, that one. Links to the show notes and full transcript of this episode is right there in the episode description. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at The Devil Podcast. And our website is thedevilpodcast.com, where you can find all of our episodes and links and other cool stuff. We do have a Patreon at patreon.com slash thedevilpodcast. For just a dollar a month or more, you can get access to the show before it releases, uh, invite to our Discord server, and have input in the show's content. We thank all of our Patreon supporters, and we really, truly couldn't make this show without you. Thank you so much. This next episode, we tackle Chapter 2 of The Origins of Satan, so stay tuned, and thank you so much for listening. Next. On the devil you don't know. And then the ass talks again. 
the talking ass. Am I not your ass that you have ridden all your life to this very day? Did I ever do such things to you? And he said no. He said no. And he said no. He said no. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> it's just such an interesting story. I just also, and with so many Bible stories, I just, I just think there are easier ways to teach a lesson. <laughs> yes. 